This is The Early Show. One thing people do is that um, they get comfortable and they think, oh, this is good. Our relationship is moving along. You know, I feel like I can be myself. And then the politeness goes away. They don't <laughs> groom the same way. So say thank you. They pee you, with the door please. open. They pee with the door open. I mean, come on. They don't wash the paint. <laughs> men and women think about it differently. For men, saying sorry means you've lost. So you take a point off. You really think about it as a game where you've lost. For women, we just want to think that you understand what we felt. If you're on the receiving end of this, how do you respond? Well, uh, you try to not go for the temptation of taking that email and forwarding it to all your friends because that's sometimes what happens with a nasty email or something that's that you right. want to share it with everybody else. And if you have, you know, let out somebody's secrets, they may just take some of yours because you know they know some if you've been together in a relationship. And there you go. It gets bigger and bigger and the uglier tit, and uglier. Tit for tat. Tit for tat. And it Absolutely. gets real ugly. If you know you're hot-headed and that you're impulsive that way, you know, other than putting 1-800-Flowers on your speed dial and learning <laughs> the fine art yep. of apologizing, which is something that we've forgotten how to do, pause, take a relationship time out, take a deep breath, and just think about the consequences. Mm -hmm. Sleep on it maybe one night and then learn Alone. from your mistakes. Alone, Alone. hopefully. <laughs> When a teacher abuses a child, why is that so particularly crushing? That's someone we trust. If you think about the images that come to your mind when you think teacher, mm -hmm. you think learning, you think mentor, they're all positive things. So it's crushing because that's the person that represents an entire institution that's supposed to be about something good. This is The Early Show. That fantasy of their wedding is one that a lot of women have. And so for her to act it out, for her to act it out might be fun. Are virtual relationships cheating? Yes. If you are spending time online that you would spend with your spouse, and if you are falling in love or in lust with that other person, it's cheating. What I would tell a patient of mine is that you're calling this second life. Well, go ahead and have your second life in real life. Um, we don't want it to happen to us, but when it happens to someone else, you know, we kind of shrug now and go, hey, it's something that happens a lot. I think we're looking at them and saying, it happens so much to your average person, and it's happening with pop culture and politicians. It's something that's across the board. I don't think people are okay with it. I think that they're going to handle it in a different way now. They're going to say, if this happens, it doesn't necessarily mean divorce. If this happens, we can work through it. So it doesn't mean that they're going to uh, just be very laissez-faire and nonchalant about it. It means that they're going to look at it and say, how do we fix this because we want to be together. They hope that their kids are learning about love in a way that's meaningful, um, however you define your relationship. It depends on your rules. You need to be truthful. Whatever the truth is, it's more important that you have a happy relationship where you're honest with each other than a monogamous one where you're unhappy. It is The Big Talker. We brought it to you first. Exclusive shocking details from Rosie O'Donnell's new book, Celebrity Detox. People smacking each other, smacking themselves with hammers to break bones. I have heard about it, and psychologically it's called Munchausen's. It's a lot like cutting that you see in adolescence, where they hurt themselves because of the emotional pain they feel inside. So yes, I have seen it. She's, you know, hung upside down. She's gone to therapy. She's done a lot of things to change. And we're not going to see a repetition of her neglecting her children. If anything, she's going to be more attentive with them. And that's exactly the point, is that without a mom there, she was not taken care of. And she had to do that in order to get attention. Weird, huh? It's hard. What could that do to a person? Well, the characters he chose were very stressful, complex characters. So I think that when we think about the combination of drugs that are there, both drugs and medication, you also have to factor in the stress of the roles he was playing and the sort of very, very hard schedule he was working under. If, so if you had a client dealing with those same issues, would you be concerned for their safety? Oh, I would definitely be concerned for their safety, especially if there was the possibility of pneumonia. So his immune system being compromised, him having infection in his lungs, problems with sleeping, and then a combination of all these other things, I would be worried. The 40 hottest hotties of the 90s, Jimmy she would sort of manhandle the men. She'd slap them around. She'd abuse them a little bit, and they loved it. 
Shania really did a lot for country because all of a sudden country got really sexual, sensual, and hot with her. Down and down. I love Fabio. He's so like over the top hot. Just kind of ridiculous hot. We all remember LL in the video doing it when he's slowly eating the apple watching the stripper. It was so sensual. Even though he was royalty, he seemed to do things on his own. He seemed to really be an independent thinker. And that made him hot. Leonardo DiCaprio. He was perfect for the role in Titanic. He was Everything was too tight, always wanted to have sex kind of hot. Short skirt for Math Monday. So we're joined now by beautiful Molly in our front row and a beautiful uh, co-host here at the table. This is Belisa Vranich. She's a therapist and a columnist. Thank you. And she's a, she's a pit bull owner too, so I like her for that I love my dog, yes. Is this a therapeutic thing to do? Is this a good thing to do? Well. It's a good thing to do, but first we have to remember that there's a long, hard road beforehand where you're arguing, where you're trying to make things work, maybe you're seeking couples counsel. So this is the end of a story. Once you finally get there, it's very therapeutic. I really recommend it. If you're going to get divorced, mourn, but then have a party. Yes. Is this something that men do too? Now, they mourn, and it is tragic for them, but 60% of marriages, of divorces, are initiated by women. So most guys will say, I don't know what happened. It sort of, you know, came out of left field, mm. which means to me is that there's women that are having a bad time, that are putting up with things they don't like, that are experiencing loneliness mm -hmm. for a while before they actually get to the, to the divorce, which is why they actually really want to party once they get there. <laughs> Also in New York, Belisa Baranich, psychologist and contributor for Women's Health Magazine. Dr. Belisa, can you shed some light on what the heck is going on here? Well, AJ, she wants to make sure that everybody has their cards on the table and that there's clarity around this. But of course she'd like things to be private. She's been around Hollywood enough to know that it was a Hollywood marriage, it's going to be a Hollywood divorce, and it's better to have clarity right from the beginning so that it doesn't end up being a three-year affair of all kinds of rumors and ugliness that the kids will have to see. What do you think, Dr. Belisa? Keeping the details public, is that better or, or worse for the kids in this Absolutely case? Absolutely better. I really think that the strategy she's using is a good one. She's saying, I know my kids are at an age where they can Google. I know they can read the papers. So let's have everything be out there so that they don't have to sneak around, so that they don't have to deal with some of that ugliness later on. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. They should be thinking about their kids first and foremost. I just wish everybody would calm the heck down. This is Today. Tiki Barber uncovers the steamy or not so steamy truth about today's modern marriages. I've recruited Belisa Vranich, a clinical psychologist and women's health columnist, and Ian Kerner, sex therapist and author. Don't most relationships start with great sex? In the first stages of infatuation, I mean, our dopamine levels are spiking in the beginning of a relationship. But sexual desire often has a tendency to cool down. When you're going from sort of fiance brain to mommy brain, the chemistry and the priorities are completely different. I tell people to just have your bedroom be about sleeping, about sex, about you being a couple. It's also about stimulating the brain. The brain really is our biggest sex organ. So great, you've removed all those distractions. Now, mm -hmm. let's, let's get in touch with each other. Let's try to fall in love a little all over again tonight. 365 nights, a memoir of intimacy. Is this possible? I think those numbers are really high and I think they could frighten a lot of people. I was going to ask you if you ever dallied at the office. Oh, but, really? Do I get you? to ask you that yeah. too? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can ask. I'm going to go to a break now. Uh, please do it for a minute.